As soon as the amateur scientist Louis Daguerre released his method of fixing an image on a sheet of metal in 1839, the hierarchy of camerist, amateur and professional photographer established itself almost overnight. I came across the term camerist in a photo magazine from the early 1900s and it sent me on a journey reading about the ways photographers classified themselves and each other when photography was in its infancy. Old magazines are the best because they've got the same information as today's blogs and YouTube videos, but with a hundred years less fluff getting in the way. A note on labeling ourselves. We don't like to do it, but for example, if you call yourself a vegetarian, then a cook knows what they can and can't serve you, so it can be helpful. So I'll summarize some of the articles I read. And once you've watched the video, let me know in the comments below if the descriptions are something you can relate to. A camerist can be anyone who uses a camera. But reading these old articles, the word is often reserved for those at the very beginning of the journey. Regarding the word amateur as compared to the word novice, there's much confusion, writes the editor in a 1912 issue of Photo Era. An amateur is one versed in, or a lover and practicer of, any particular pursuit but not engaged in it professionally. A novice is one who is new or inexperienced. The camerist, I think, is a novice who'd be obsessed with collecting cameras or simply collecting memories. Kodak went all in targeting this market with a slogan, you take the picture, we do the rest. They removed hurdles for those who'd never taken a photograph otherwise. This turned camerists into Kodakers. Step changes in accessibility happened again and again over the decades, with the introduction of roll film, 35mm cameras and then automatic cameras, if you think the iPhone was the first camera that made everyone into a photographer, then you've missed almost 200 years of people saying exactly the same thing. It's been said that no true camerist is ever seen twice with the same camera. Does that sound familiar? This quote isn't a recent one, but from a Photo Era magazine in 1917. But this stage is not the final one. The average adult snap shooter is not interested in art and will not be bothered with technical knowledge, mused one writer, but how to transform the indifferent press the button offender into an amateur photographer. I think being an amateur is the sweet spot for photography. Even working professionals allow themselves to be amorous with their craft through personal projects or pro bono work. The rules for submitting photos to Life magazine in the 1930s, 40s and 50s set a level playing field. Amateur photographers are welcome as contributors, but their work must compete with professionals on an equal basis and will be judged and paid for as such. The label distinction was based on whether the photographer made a living from making pictures, but the criteria here was the quality of the work. Labeling yourself helped you pick what publications you needed to read to get the most out of photography. A magazine aimed at professionals with articles on window displays, advertising, and complaining about amateurs would be useless for an amateur. Not so different from today. The downside of labeling photographers is when it becomes an exercise in one-upmanship. Amateurs were often subcategorized when it came to competitions run by clubs or magazines, with the beginner categories being more general and the winners showing that they had the quality to call themselves advanced workers. There'll always be orders of magnitude more amateurs than professionals, which has long been recognized as a symbiotic relationship. Edward Newcomb in a 1900 issue of The Professional and Amateur Photographer recognized that if it were not for the multitude of amateurs, hypo would probably be 50 cents a pound, dry plates twice the price, and endless other conveniences lacking. Amateurs have invented their share of improvements, done lots of experimenting, and brought better understanding of photography into the land. The Photo Era editor in 1918 describes the signature of a letter sent to him. In large type beneath his name, the designation amateur photographer. In one corner quite conspicuously appears a well-known make of camera. Sounds a lot like a beginner's Instagram profile to me. He mentioned this letter to make a point that calling yourself an amateur photographer might be appropriate 
if you only make an occasional picture and distribute prints without making any charge for them. If the photographer in question, in a desire to advertise his activity as a sideline, let him proclaim himself a professional amateur photographer. You might also think of the phrase semi-professional. I've never heard a photographer call themselves pro-am, but this label is used in some sports, so maybe we should adopt it too. It describes the modern side hustler, something that could be dialed up to full professional in the future. The Bulletin of Photography, though it was aimed at professionals, often stood up for the amateur and presented the benefits that they offered. The hand camera and the Kodak have had to stand much abuse from a certain class in the professional ranks. This type of photographer has in nearly every instance come from the ranks of the amateur. The more people conversant with amateur work, the greater will be the demand for the higher class of work from the art studios. This education of the public has done more than anything else in abating the demand for the absurdly cheap type of photograph. A 1939 article by a photographic examiner said, if anyone should curb the privilege of the amateur to sell his worthy shots, he'd be hindering the rapid increase of amateur interest because it's most natural and most American to desire to sell the products of our creative ability. He recognised that professionals rely on the sheer number of amateurs to raise the photographic consciousness of the public and that professionals profit from selling supplies and education to amateurs. Interestingly, he also asks, what's the difference between the professional and the amateur photographer? I'm frank to admit it's a hard line to draw and harder to put into words. The Pro-Am had a fine line to walk to differentiate themselves from the Kodakers without upsetting the professionals that they'd eventually like to rub shoulders with. And here's a rule as near the wished for formula as the amateur will ever get. Take pictures for yourself, wrote Ida Bale in 1900. If you cannot enjoy your pictures, no one else will. And everyone else may not, even if you do. Fred Wright wrote in a 1904 issue of The Camera that a person ceases to be an amateur photographer, in the strict sense of the word, the instant they accept cash in excess of the cost incurred in making of their pictures. The definition of the word professional is simple. A person who gains their livelihood through the making of pictures with a camera. It really has nothing to do with the quality of the work or the personality and habits of the worker, though the definition gets stretched in all sorts of ways, especially when comparisons to amateurs are made. Rob Schwalberg in Pop Photo 1989 makes the distinction based on the necessity of getting a result. He says, I've known a lot of amateurs whose photo technical knowledge was far deeper than that of the average working pro. But having the outlook of the problem solver who'll do their best to get the job done is the hallmark of true professionalism. A rant in the 1944 issue of the same magazine argued, every amateur picture is served with an apology. We professionals have to sell a picture not on the strength of what we try to do, but solely on what we have accomplished. Halleck Finley continues to make points on the professional's duty to carry out ideas suggested by someone else. Though critical, I think there's an important point here, that the amateur has the privilege and freedom of choosing their own subject. The editorial from a 1915 copy of Photo Era argued that equipment was a key differentiator for the professional, which makes sense back then given that they had a dedicated space for larger cameras and dark rooms. Admitting the talented amateur with advantages in spontaneity and originality frequently surpassed the professional, it's yet to be shown that he bests him on the technical side of the art. Here the professional excels because of the efficiency and latitude of his apparatus and the conditions of the light and room at his command. The editor is talking about the efficiency of the camera despite its bulk and access to the right lens and studio conditions for the job. Remember what we said earlier that quality and profession didn't necessarily go hand in hand. Check out this scathing letter that the Globe Chamber of Commerce sent to the Bulletin of Photography in 1908. There's really a fine opening for a good portrait photographer here in Globe, Arizona. Three 
so-called portrait men are butchering the profession and making a good living because the poor public cannot help themselves. Way to insult the entire town. But fair point, labeling someone else or yourself a professional says nothing about the quality of the work. To keep our definition straight, the editor in a 1912 issue of Photo Era explained, the professional photographer who's new and unskilled is a novice and not an amateur. It's also worth remembering that the professionals were throwing stones from glass houses. Their work might be superior to the camerist, but they only used a camera in the first place because they didn't have the skills to make a portrait with paintbrushes. Oil painters in the early 20th century still had the advantage of colour and flattering a portrait subject by rejecting any parts of reality that didn't do them justice. The camerist, the amateur and the professional. This might be a progression or something we dip in and out of depending on the hour of day or the season of our lives. I find it fascinating and amusing that these comparisons and rants have been the same from the oldest magazine articles to the newest online videos. What sort of photographer are you?